However, something that's less complicated to control is called the family-wise aerate. And when we do GWAS in the next module, this is going to become really important. <clears throat> and when we talk about family-wise air rate, we usually talk about this thing called type 1 air. And as far as I'm aware, there's no difference between a false positive and a type 1 air. It just depends who you ask what terminology they're going to use. So a lot of times these guys are called type 1 air. And your family-wise air rate isn't really a rate, it's actually a probability, but it's the probability of having one or more type 1 errors. <clears throat> and uh, statistically, one or more type 1 errors, that probability is really hard to calculate, but conveniently, if we do one minus the probability of no type 1 errors, we get the same value. And this is much, much easier to calculate. So let's do a scenario here. So under our scenario, we can assume that all tests are null. So we actually don't expect to see anything in the data. Nothing, there's no real effects. And we have the threshold of 0 0.05, and you do one test. So what is your expected family-wise error rate? So again, what's a family-wise error rate? Or what's a, what, sorry, what's a type 1 error? It's a false positive, right? And if I do one test and my significance threshold is 0 0.05, what's my probability of a false positive? 5%. 5 so what's the probability of not a false positive? 95. 95. Right, so my fam family-wise error rate is 1 minus my probability of not a false positive, which is 0 0.05. And what if my threshold now is 0 0.001? What's my family-wise error rate going to be? <clears throat> it's the same thing, right? Because my probability of not a type 1 error is 0 0.999 and 0 0.01. So this point's kind of key, is that if you only do one test, whatever your significance threshold is, is also your family-wise error rate. And a lot of times people want to control their family-wise error rate at 0 0.05. And so if you're only doing one test, it's then kind of appropriate to use a significance threshold of 0 0.05 because you're controlling how many of these type 1 errors you have. All right, scenario two. Exact same thing, but now we do two tests. So what's the probability? So we said the probability of having no type 1 errors for one test is 0.95. What's the probability of having no type 1 errors if we do two tests? 0.95 squared, right? Because they're independent tests, so it's the probability of the first one being not a false positive times the probability of the second one not being a false positive. And so we get this equation. But you can see up here that when we control at a threshold of 0 0.05, all of a sudden our family-wise error rate is approaching like 0.1. So like we have almost a 10% chance now of having a type 1 error in our data. Whereas if we have this higher threshold, what do we think is going to happen? It, it's going to be lower, right? Because if you square a number really close to 1, it stays pretty close to 1. And so as you can see down here with this higher threshold, the family-wise error rate still stays really low. All right. Third example, now we do M tests. So who can tell me what the equation looks like for family-wise error rate if you do M tests? Exactly. It's 0.595 to the N, and for the bottom one, it's 0.99 to the M. And so this equation will tell us what our family-wise error rate is, is going to be for any test we do. And the cool part is we can actually do this before we do this study. So before you do any study, you can figure out what you want your significance thresholds to be so that you can make sure that you don't have a lot of false positives when you actually do the study. All right. Um, so we do this. And then we have this fantastic little equation. It's probably one of the easiest equations you've ever seen before. So this tells you how to set your threshold if you want to control for a certain family-wise error rate. So let's say I want a family-wise error rate of 0 0.05, or yeah, 0 
what I do is I take 0 0.05 and I divide it by the number of tests that I'm doing and that tells me what my threshold should be. So in genetics, say we want a 0 0.05 family-wise error rate, a lot of times we're testing about a million SNPs. And so when we do that, we take the two numbers, divide, and we get this value here. And it's really, really small. And this is the significant threshold we need to use when looking for if a SNP like affects height across the entire genome. Because every time we test one of those SNPs, we have this probability of a false discovery or of a false positive. But if we use this as our significant threshold, then we're basically convincing ourselves that we only have a 0 0.05 chance of having a false positive when we look at every SNP in the genome, which means we're much more confident of our results. Um, a lot of times you'll hear this phrase when you go to lectures that they used a Bonferroni corrected threshold of 0 0.05. And what that means is that they set their threshold in such a way that it controlled the family-wise error rate at 0 0.05 is how you should interpret this. And this little division operation is called Bonferroni correction. All right, so in conclusion, you should memorize what a p-value is for a future job interview. And the p-value says nothing about the alternative. All it says is the probability of your data under the null. And your significance threshold it's your likelihood of wrongly rejecting the null hypothesis or making a type 1 error on each test, assuming that the null is true. And you can use it to control family-wise error rate and the false discovery rate. And using the Bonferroni corrected threshold, you can use that to control the family-wise error rate. And that's our module. Are there any questions? All right.